Good morning. If you will stand with me as we sing our call to worship this morning. It's hymn number 655, Sanctuary. We'll sing through it twice. Amen. Isn't that a beautiful song? Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. You know, that's, that's the wonder of the Christian life, is that when you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, that His Spirit comes to dwell within you. And you are the sanctuary. You're the temple of God. And when you are the sanctuary, Jesus says this, You, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden, and neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Lord, thank you so much uh, for this day, a day set aside uh, to worship you uh, in this sanctuary. But Lord, I pray that you would remind us that we are the living sanctuaries. Lord, every day, Lord, I pray that we would pursue you that we would worship you, that we would allow you to fill us with your spirit so that our lives, Lord, can be the salt of the earth, that we can be the light of the world, that others can see Jesus in us, Lord, through our attitudes and through our actions, that we can make a difference for Christ, Lord, in, in our community. Lord, I pray today as we worship you in spirit and truth that you would speak to our hearts, Lord, about things in our lives that, that may be preventing us, that may have be, may be taken away our saltiness or dimming our light. And I pray, God, that, that today that we would be willing, Lord, to submit to you, Lord, to come to you, Lord, in confession and repentance, Lord, to come to you with a recommitment of our hearts and of our lives. So, Lord, that is, as believers, we can be those sanctuaries pure and holy. Lord, that we can be the salt, Lord, where we work and, and in all the different ways that we interact with others. Lord, help us, God, today to set our hearts right with you through our worship, Lord, so that we can be who you call us to be, not only today, Lord, but every day, and make a difference for Christ from our families to our communities. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now we'll sing 106. Worthy you are worthy. We'll sing all three verses. Holy, you are holy, holy, you are holy, King 
King of kings, Lord of lords, I worship. for our offertory hymn 353 victory in Jesus we'll sing the first and third Dear Lord, God, we're just thankful for this day, Lord. Thank you for every come out and worship you, God. And Lord, we just pray, Lord, that you'll bless this service, Lord, be with Brother Chad as he delivers this message, Lord. God, we just pray, Lord, that you'll be with those that are in need, Lord, those that are sick, those that have lost loved ones, Lord. We just pray, Lord, you place your healing hand upon them, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you'll be with us throughout this week and bring us back next week. We pray these things in your precious son's holy name. Amen.
This morning as a congregation for our special, I was, um, we sang this song when we visited with Scott's family with their church when we were all shut down during quarantine time. And they sang this as their invitation without him. And it's an old hymn. And I could remember singing it as I was in the youth group growing up here in Friendship. And it really spoke to me because, you know, really without him, we, we could do nothing. And sometimes it takes um, uh, things happening that brings us to our knees, you know, that makes us, that reminds us that we really can't do anything without him. Um, from work, from parenting, from uh, whatever it is that we're doing in our life, without him, we cannot do anything. So I pray we may butcher this song musically, but I pray that you hear the message in this song as we sing it together this morning. And I hope some of you know it so you can sing with me. Um, but if you don't know the Lord and Savior, I pray that God speaks to your heart this morning because you just don't know having Him changes everything for you. You know, without Him, we can do nothing. 504 it is in your hymn book. If you want to go with your hymn book, we will sing both verses. Amen. Do you know? Do you know him today? You know, knowing him makes all the difference uh, in your life, doesn't it? And <clears throat> wow, how lost would we be uh, without him? Matthew chapter five. If you would look with me there, and we're going to look at several passages of uh, scripture this morning. So, if you will get your Bibles out, we're going to run through several passages. You know, when you know Jesus, when you have Him in your life, not only does that make a difference uh, in your heart, when you experience the forgiveness of your sin, when you experience the freedom that Christ brings, when you become a child of God and have an eternal purpose, that makes all the difference in who you are and in how you live. But not only does it make a difference within you, Christ should make a difference through you. In other words, you should make a difference 
in the world around you. Now, maybe you have some of this at your house. Y'all have any of this at y'all's house? You know, we all have salt in our house, right? Because it's great for cooking, it's great for lots of other things, right? And today I want us to talk about what Jesus means in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. Jesus says, you, the church, the Christian, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Listen to what the Lord says to you and to me today. You, you are the salt of the earth. Let's pray together. Lord, I pray that you would take your word today and from this passage of Scripture and from other passages of Scripture, Lord, help us to, to understand what it means to be the salt of the earth as a believer. Lord, I pray that you would help us to see, Lord, that you have changed our hearts. You have made a difference within us so that we can make a difference, Lord, in the world around us. And Lord, I pray that each of us today, as we look at your word and as we hear your spirit speak to our hearts, that you would help us, Lord, to see how we can apply your truth to our circle of influence where others can see Jesus in us. That through our witness, Lord, through our walk and through our work, Lord, that, that we will make a positive difference. That we will be the salt of the earth. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. You know, in the ancient world, salt was one of the most valuable commodities. Since there was no refrigeration as in our modern world, salt was used as a preservative to prevent decay. Like in our modern world, salt was also used to flavor food and to improve taste. Salt was such a valuable product in all of its uses that salt was actually used in the commerce. People would buy and sell products. They would buy and sell services with salt back in the ancient world. And when that gave rise to the phrase that a productive person was worth their salt. So Jesus takes this valuable element of salt in his, within the ancient culture and he teaches a very important lesson about the influence of the believer up on the culture. You know, as we think about that today, I want you to consider this. As a Christian, you are either going to be influenced by culture and have no influence for Christ, or either you're going to make an influence upon your culture for Christ. One way or the other. You're going to have a, make a positive difference in your community for Christ or no difference. And what Jesus says when Jesus says that you are the salt of the earth, Jesus says that God saved you. God made a difference in your life so that through your life, the gospel can make a difference in your community. Paul wrote, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. His sinless life, his sacrificial death, and his glorious resurrection that changes a person's heart, that brings peace into our lives, that gives hope for eternity. The gospel is what brings forgiveness to the burdened soul. Freedom from painful addictions and sinful lifestyles. The gospel is what reconciles marriages and families and relationships with others. The gospel heals hurting hearts and men's broken lives. The gospel fulfills a person's life with meaning and purpose. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. And if you have trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you've walked through those waters of baptism, are you ashamed of the gospel? Or is God at work in your life 
Has He made a difference in you and you're making a difference in the world around you? You know, today we stand at, at a critical time in our, in our country. Inauguration of a new president, President Biden. And as promised on the campaign trail, he's already started putting policies in place. And if you've been keeping up, a lot of those policies be very hostile to faith and to freedom, especially the Christian faith. And we're entering a time in our country where being a real Christian is going to matter. Being different from the world is going to matter. We're entering a time where it's going to show who the real Christians are and who are fake. And that's why today I want to talk about the fact that where we sit in our community and as a church, we're called to be the salt. And what does that mean? It means that we're different. We're different. We're distinct from our culture. We're distinct from our world. Like salt, believers have been changed by their faith. They should be distinctively different in their attitude and in their actions. Your testimony for Christ and the Christ-likeness of your character is to make a positive difference in the world around you. Jesus is saying that the believer, wherever they are, should flavor their world with the truth of the gospel. He's saying that a believer's witness should serve as this preservative to the spiritual and moral decay of, of the society around them. That through your testimony, through your lifestyle, you, like salt, are to create thirst in other people for Jesus. Now, this morning I want you to think about this. You have a circle of influence. You have your friends at school. You have teammates that you, that you play with. Uh, you have people that you work with in your office, on your job. You have a circle of influence from your family to your friends to your social media to the people that you are acquaintances with. You have a circle of influence. It is everyone that you are connected with and that comes across your path on a daily basis. You have a circle of influence. The world around you, your little world. And the question is, Jesus says you are the salt. What kind of difference are you making in your circle of influence? When people think of you, when they think of your name, do they think of Jesus? If you are being the salt of your earth, when people think of you, they're going to think of Christ. Oh, they're a Christian. Oh, they live for Jesus. That's what it means to be the salt of the earth. That people think of Jesus when they think of you. So if you and I are going to be the salt, if we're going to make a difference in our circle of influence, what do we need to do? Well, let's have a salt talk this morning. How about that? And let's take the word salt, and how do we spell it? S-A-T. Y'all are highly educated. What is it? S-A-L-T. That's right. So we are highly educated individuals, and we know how to spell, right? But the important thing is, is as Christians, do we know how to live that? And I want to take that word salt, S-A-L-T, and look at Scripture and let's see what does it actually mean to be the salt of the earth? What does it mean to be a salty Christian? 
to make a difference in your circle of influence. And there's four ingredients. There's four ingredients to be a salty Christian in your circle of influence. So let's begin with the first letter. And that first letter is what? S. S stands for submit to the Lord. Submit to the Lord. This is where it all begins. There is absolutely no way that you can make a positive difference for Christ in your circle of influence if you do not live in submission to the Lord. It is impossible. There are two ways to live your life. You can live according to the ways of the world or you can live according to the will of God. That's your choices. The Bible warns us about the world. Because God's way and God's will is distinctively different. When you read the Bible, you'll see that the believer has a different set of moral principles than those of the world. You'll see that a believer has different priorities, different pursuits, and a different purpose. That's why the Bible warns us about the world. It says, for everything in the world, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16... Everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life or the pride of material possessions is not from the Father but from the world. These are the things, these are the ways the world operates. The world operates, the system of the world. Now, John is saying here, not, not like in John 3.16, for God so loved the world. That word means general humanity. Here, the word, the word that John's talking about from, for world means the systems of this world that are opposed to Christ. Okay? So, when he says the world, how does the world operate? How does humanity tend to operate? The lust of the flesh, according to how we feel and what pleases us, right? The lust of the eyes, according to what we want around us. And then the pride of life, what's going to build us up, what is going to promote self. This is the way the world operates. And when we love the world, the love of the Father is not in us. And in verse 17 it says, and the world and its lust, the way it operates, is going to pass away. But the one who does the will of God remains forever. The will of God is the only thing that's going to last Forever. There's two ways to operate in your life. According to the ways of the world or according to the will of God. And you make the choice. So how do we make that choice? I'm glad you asked that question. If you go to Luke chapter 9 verse 23. This is what it means to submit to the Lord. Jesus gives us a visual. Luke chapter 9 verse 23. Jesus says... Whoever wants to be my disciple, verse 23, whoever wants to be my disciple, if you want to choose to follow me, Jesus said, you must deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it and whoever loses their life for me will save it. So Jesus says, here's the choice. You can live according to the ways of the world, or you can live according to the will of God. And in order to do that, it requires that in the choices you make, and you make choices every day, you choose what you're going to eat, you choose what you're going to wear, you choose what you're going to watch, you choose how you're going to present yourself, you choose how you're going to spend your money, you choose how you're going to react to every situation in your life. How are you going to react to other people? How are you going to treat people? You make choices every single day. And when you make those choices, you will either make those choices according to the ways of the world or according to the will of God. To make them according to the will of God means that you deny yourself and you take up your cross and you follow Jesus in your daily choices. You do it his way and not your way. Now, sometimes you've heard Christians say, well, we all have a cross to bear in referring to burdens and referring to struggles and referring to challenges in life. We all have a cross to bear, right? But that's not what Jesus is talking about here. When Jesus says you must deny yourself and take up your cross, 
That image is not of a burden or a struggle. That is an image of death. When you saw someone carrying a cross in Jesus' day, they were on their way to a humiliating, horrific death and execution. What Jesus is saying is that if you're going to follow me, if you're really going to be distinct and different, if you're going to be salty, it requires you in the choices of your life to die to yourself in order to live for me. Submit to the Lord. It is the first step to being salty. The second is this. What's our second letter? A. That's right. Philippians chapter 2. Turn there. In order to be salty, not only must you submit to the Lord in the choices that you make, but you must have the attitude of Christ. Now let me ask you this question. You ever known anybody that has a bad attitude? You ever known anybody that has a bad attitude? Don't look at them. Don't look at them. Whether it's a sports team or whether it's your office or whether it's your workplace or whatever that you do, whether it's church, isn't it something how one person with a bad attitude can affect everybody else? That's something, isn't it? Your attitude not only affects those around you, but your attitude is critical to becoming who God saved you to be and fulfilling God's purpose in your life. So how do you define attitude? Here's a definition. Your attitude is a settled way of thinking or feeling about someone, something, or a situation that is typically reflected in your behavior. So an attitude is a settled way of thinking toward life and toward other people that is reflected in your behavior. You can also define it like this. An attitude is a mindset toward people and life that influences how you act. Here's a great quote. Excellence is not a skill. It is an attitude. Excellence is not a skill, it is an attitude. And that quote reflects a truth. When it comes to the Christian life, your attitude is key to your actions. It is key to whether or not you will be the salt of the earth. Your mindset will determine whether or not you make a difference for Christ. Plain and simple. When it comes to your attitude, the standard of excellence is always Jesus. In Philippians chapter 2, it is a premier statement of our attitude. Look with me there, Philippians chapter 2. And in this context, Paul is talking about our relationships with other people, our relationships in the church and with others. And he says this, He says in verse 5, he says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset, the same attitude as Christ Jesus. Pause just a moment and ask yourself that question. Is your attitude the same as that of Christ Jesus? Is your attitude... In your family, in your marriage, is your attitude the same as Christ Jesus's? In your workplace, the people you work with, in church, in the community, on your on your sports teams, or the, the clubs that you're in, or whatever team or activity that you're a part of, is your attitude the same as that of Christ Jesus? To be salt, you're called to have the same attitude as Jesus. What is that attitude? Let's look at verse 6. It says, Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used to his own advantage. In other words, held on to. He was the eternal Son of God. He deserved to be worshipped. Everything was created through Him. You were created through Him. He deserved, He has the right, He has the privilege to be worshipped. But He said He did not hold on to the equality of God. 
It says, rather he made himself nothing and he took the very nature of a servant. He was made in human likeness and he was found in the appearance of a man. He humbled himself. He became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. What is Paul saying about Jesus' attitude? It is, this is an extremely important passage of scripture to understand because it says your attitude is to be like his attitude. So what are the three things about his attitude that Paul mentions? Number one, he was completely unselfish. He was unselfish. He had the right to be worshipped. He had every right to be worshipped. When you go to the book of Revelations, it says the lamb that was slain deserves power and glory and honor and praise and worship. He had every right, but he denied his own privilege. He denied what was to his own advantage. He was completely unselfish because he put the needs of humanity above his own rights and privileges as the Son of God. Unselfish. He was also humble. He humbled himself and took the form of a servant. Humility is a choice, you know that? You either exalt yourself or you either can exalt others. What did Jesus do? When he came to earth, he came as a servant, not as a celebrity. We live in a celebrity-driven world, don't we? It's about fame, it's about money, it's about power, it's about promoting yourself and lifting yourself up and receiving all the praise, right? But what did Jesus do? He was a servant, not a celebrity. He walked in humility and not in the pride of life according to the ways of the world. And he did it for what reason? To obey the will of God. To obey the will of God with his life. To die on the cross. To fulfill God's will and to bring God glory. And that's why you exist. To fulfill God's will to bring God glory. And so therefore, the attitude of Christ is the most important thing. Is to do God's will and to live God's way. And to bring God glory in my life and in my relationships. That is the attitude of Christ. It is unselfish, it is humility, it is obedience to God as your top priority. Now let me ask you this question. In your marriage, in your relationships, among your co-workers, on your sports teams, in your activities, organizations that you belong to, what would happen if you demonstrated unselfishness and humility and obedience to the will of God within those relationships, how would that influence people for Christ? And how can you do that tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day? That's what it means to have the attitude of Christ, is that you are demonstrating this unselfishness, this humility, and this obedience to God to do it His way, to live according to His will. The third thing is this. What's the next letter? S... A, oh yeah, L, the one I almost forgot, right? And it is the most important. L stands for love, the love of Christ. It is absolutely the most influential ingredient to making a difference in the world around you. Nothing will make more of a difference in the life of another person than for you to love them like Jesus. Nothing. Nothing. It is the most important. God's love is very different from the love that we find in this world. The love you find in the world is, I'm going to love you if you like me. I'm going to love you if you love me. If you make me feel good and we get along, I'll love you. It is a conditional love. It is actually a selfish love because we love out centered around ourself. The love of the world is centered on self. The love of God is always centered on Christ. It is about loving someone for their best interest. It is about putting the best interest of another person ahead of your own interest as your priority. It is about acting in the best interest, and get this, it is about acting in the best interest of another person regardless of how you feel. That's why Jesus said, love your enemies. 
And that's how you can love an enemy. Is you, even though you may feel a certain way toward them, you act in a way that is in their best interest. That's love. That's why the Bible says that even while we were enemies of God, He demonstrated His love for us, that He sent His Son to die in our place. Now that's love, isn't it? Before you ever thought of God, and when you were living in your hostility and in your sin against God, He had already sent Jesus to die for you. That's love. And this is what the Bible says in 1 John 13, 34 through 35. It says, a new, Jesus said, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, Jesus says, as I have loved you, so you must want love one another. Jesus says, the new command is my standard and my example for loving is now your standard and your example for loving. And what example is that? How did Jesus love you? He loved you unconditionally. He loved you unselfishly. And He loved you sacrificially. Now I want you to think about this. I want you to think about the kid that shows up at our youth group. You know, it's tough being a youth. With all the different little cliques and groups and, and how this person feels and that person. You know, you know how all that goes. And how easy it is to be left out and to feel left out for very different reasons. So a kid shows up at a youth group. What's going to happen if they are reached out to unconditionally sacrificially and unselfishly. How is it going to change the office in which you work in when that co-worker that gets on your last nerve actually sees sacrifice and unselfishness and unconditional love through you? When somebody is loved like Jesus through you, it makes the biggest difference in this world. The love of God is this. It is patient. It is kind. It's not about envying. It's not about boasting. It's not about being proud. It does not dishonor people. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. It does not delight in evil. It rejoices with the truth. It protects. It trusts. It hopes. It perseveres. Now let me ask you this question from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. What would it look like in the, in, in the circle of influence in your life if that is the way you love the people within the circle of your influence? With patience and kindness. Not with pride or self-seeking, but with respect and honor and forgiveness. You see, that's why Paul says at the very beginning of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul says, without love I'm nothing, and without love I gain nothing. It doesn't matter if I have faith that can move mountains. It doesn't matter if I give my body, listen, if I give my body to the flames, in other words, I die for Christ. I gain nothing if it's not in love. Think about that. There's nothing that we do at church. If, how can I put it? No matter what we do at church, program-wise or anything else, Paul says we gain nothing and it doesn't matter if it's not done in love. That's how important it is. Jesus said, he finished up in verse 35. Jesus says, by this, in John 13, he says, by this, everyone will know you are my disciples if you love one another. It is the most important ingredient to being salty because when you love other people the way Jesus did, that's when you influence them for Christ the most. Now let's look at the last letter. Salt. 
Spell it with me. S A L T. Submit to the Lord, have the attitude of Christ, love other people like Jesus, and the T is for the truth of God. It, that's the foundation. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, Jesus said, Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against the house, and yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. It was built on the truth of God's word. That is the key. The truth of God's word has to be the foundation of your character and your moral conduct. That has to do with your integrity. Your integrity. Truth should form the foundation of your integrity as a Christian. Now, integrity means to be solid, to be whole, to be complete. But when you talk about integrity in relation to your character... It doesn't mean to be that you're perfect or that you never make a mistake or that you never sin. Integrity means that you are genuine. You are real. It means that you truly live by the truth in which you believe. Integrity means that in all things, at all times, in front of all people, that you practice what you preach. That's what it means. At all times, in all things, in front of all people, you practice what you preach. You're real. That's based on the truth of God's Word. A Christian can lose their witness. They can tarnish their testimony very fast through a hateful attitude hurtful word, or an immoral action. The Christian life is a process of growing and becoming and striving to live up to our name and living in a way that people think of Christ when they think of you. And that only happens when you have integrity When you stand up for the truth of God's word, you don't compromise that truth and you seek to live out that truth in your life. This is what Jesus prayed for the believers in John chapter 17. It's what he prays for us in relation to the world. Jesus said this in John 17, 17. Jesus said, sanctify them. Sanctify these believers, God. Sanctify means to set apart, to make them holy, to make them pure, to make them who they're saved to be, to make them different from the world. Jesus says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. That's what he prayed for you. That you would come to the truth of God's word, that you would allow that truth to be the foundation of your life so that you operate You live, you set your priorities, you set your purpose, you set your principles, your morals, your values according to the truth of God's word and you live by them in all, at all times, in all circumstances, in front of all people, you live the truth of God's word. That's how you're salty. That's how you're salty. You know, Peter and the apostles in Acts 5 were brought before the Sanhedrin. They were under trial for living for Christ, for being a witness, for being a testimony for Christ. They were told not to proclaim the gospel any longer. And this is what they declared in Acts 5.19. They said together, we must obey God rather than man. To obey God rather than man is to be salty. Submit to the Lord, have the attitude of Christ, love like Jesus, and stand on the truth of God's Word. And I'd say they were pretty salty, wouldn't you? I'd say they impacted their circle of influence. 
They changed the world. They changed the world. From the early church to the modern church, Christ-like believers, the salt of the earth, people at every level of society have influenced the world for Christ. For centuries, salty Christians have changed their communities, their cultures, and even their countries. I think about a particular fast food chain. They didn't invent the chicken. They just invented the chicken sandwich. Who is that? Chick-fil-A. You like eating a Chick-fil-A? Who doesn't love the Chick-fil-A commercial? Eat more chicken, right? A number of years ago, we had the privilege at the Gridiron Men's Conference to hear Dan Cathy speak about their Christian business structure. Dan Cathy is the son of Truett Cathy, who was the founder of Chick-fil-A, and he's the next generation of leadership for that company. Chick-fil-A is one of the nation's largest family-owned businesses, and it was founded upon Christian principles and operated through Christian values. As we heard Dan Cathy speak at that Gridiron Conference, he explained the mindset, he explained the attitude from which the company based its decisions. And he said that the company put people ahead of profits, that they trained their employees to value each customer as a person and to seek to provide the best quality food and the best quality service for every customer because every customer is valued. Now, how many of you have ever been treated nice when you've gone to Chick-fil-A? They bend over backwards, don't they? That's based on the mindset that has been incorporated into their system and how they train their employees It is a Christ-centered model that is separated from the models of the world that are based on profit. But yet there's another distinct difference in the business operations of Chick-fil-A that has always been, and I wonder if you can guess it. Chick-fil-A has always been closed on Sunday. That's very different from the ways of the world, isn't it? You know any other businesses... Any other restaurants that do that? As a matter of fact, I remember seeing a Zaxby's commercial. And a Zaxby's commercial, I haven't seen it in a long time, but the Zaxby's commercial actually had, I was two, I forgot who the celebrities were, but they were walking up to, to uh, get chicken in the door. They were like, oh no, it's, it's not open on Sunday. So they were debating, you know, whether to go in, and then they pull the door, and they're like, oh, it is open, and they walk in, and it's a Zaxby's instead of Chick-fil-A. And the commercial was a shot at the faith and the values of Chick-fil-A because they're different. They're salty. They're salty. With a firm handshake and a kind smile, Dan Cathy, the chairman the chief executive officer of Chick-fil-A, greets a family in a restaurant dining room by saying this, Hi, I'm Dan. I work in customer service. From top corporations to businesses to the places where we work, you're called to be the salt of the earth. You're called to make a difference for Christ in your circle of influence. There are people who work for you. There are people who work alongside you. There are people you work for. There are people that you associate with from social media to ball games to wherever that you go. You and I are called to be the salt of the earth to make a difference for Jesus. How salty are you? As we close this morning, I want to remind you of something. We might look through 
those things, salt. Submit to the Lord, have the attitude of Christ, love like Jesus, and stand on the truth of God's word. And you might say, you know what, I've lost my saltiness. I'm missing some of those key ingredients. You might even feel today that because of a hateful attitude, a hurtful word, or, or a sinful, ungodly act in some way, that you've lost that saltiness. And you know, Jesus said, if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? And the answer to the question is it can't. <laughs> it can't. Because by nature it's either salt or by nature it's not. It either has properties and its qualities or it doesn't. So here's the idea that Jesus is saying. Is if you lost your saltiness, if you're missing the ingredients, you can't get it back on your own. You can only be made salty through the grace of God and the Spirit of God at work in your life. You can only be made salty when you choose to stop living by the ways of the world, confess your sin, repent of your sin, return to God, and submit yourself to Him all over again. So are you salty? And if you're not, how come? And if you're not, are you willing to come back to the Lord today and be made salty again? Lord, thank you for this day and your blessings. And God, as we have this time of invitation, Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. And God, that you would find hearts that are willing, Lord, to be open to you. Lord, to receive your word, to repent, of our sin, to return and resubmit our life to you as Lord and Savior. For Lord, today in our time, in our culture, and in the challenges that we face, Lord, friendship needs to be salt. We need to be salt wherever we are, making a difference for Christ as we're waiting for His return. So, Lord, may your work be done. May your will be done. And, Lord, I pray on every pew today that there will be hearts that choose the will of God for their life rather than the ways of the world. That you can make us salty and we can glorify God for which we were created and saved to be. And we ask these things in Jesus' name.